It's very good to see everyone. And uh, Elijah Dean, will you lead us in prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day that you have given to us that we can come out and worship you and study your word. And we please pray that you be with those that are not able to be here due to illness and help them to recover quickly. Please be with those that are traveling. And thank you for seeing your son Jesus die on the cross to save us from our sins. And please be with those that have pointed from you that they might come back to you. Please help our souls be saved. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, Ephesians chapter 3. Let's begin by reading verses 1 through 7. Ephesians 3, 1 through 7. We'll grab that for us. J.D. Ephesians 3. For this cause I call the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles. If you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given me to you or how that by revelation he may know unto me the mystery as I wrote a for a few words. Whereby when you read you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ which in all the ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body, and partakers, partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel, whereof I was made a minister, according to the gift of the grace of God, given unto me by the effectual working of his power. Okay. So question number one, I ask, what was the dispensation given to Paul and how did he view it? I understand the dispensation being that of the church. I don't want to say church age because that tends to lean towards, but the, the New Testament authority of uh, the dispensations are from the time of the Old Testament and the New Testament. So, yeah, there in 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 that yeah. context that you're talking about, there's the the three dispensations: right. the patriarchal, the mosaical, and the gospel. And Paul says that he's been given this a dispensation. What's his? particular dispensation, Ron? Would it be his stewardship that he was given that, uh, you know, as we know, the apostles were ministers of the word of truth? Right. Right, exactly. Clint? His, his specific job was to go to the Gentiles. <laughs> yeah, so Jesus asked him, you're going to go, you're going to leave your home, you're going to leave the Jews, even though you're fully qualified to teach them, and you're going to be with the Gentiles. That, I believe, is the specific dispensation that he's talking about within the context here. Right. If you um, were to do a cross-reference over in uh, Galatians chapter 2, Paul's talking about that Peter had a work among the Jews while he had a work among the Gentiles. And as he discusses this, and, and as Clint was saying in the context here, he goes on to talk about his role and what he's doing with the Gentiles, but that it is that apostleship that he had of going out and teaching the gospel to the Gentiles. So how did he view that? Verse 2. Clint. It was a gift, the grace of God. Okay. Uh, where's Paul when he's writing this letter? Why? Why is he in prison? What's that, GD? <laughs> I'm sorry for preaching for preaching Christ. Yes, he's he's in prison for fulfilling his dispensation. For, for the, but he says this is a gift of God. This was the grace of God that was given to me. So he, he viewed it as a good thing, as a beneficial thing, in spite of the fact that he was in prison at the time of, of writing this letter. And it's very interesting also in connection with that. In verse 1, what, how does he describe himself? 
prisoner of Christ. Prisoner of Christ. But he was sitting in a prison of Rome. But he says, I'm a prisoner of Christ. I'm captive to him. I'm a servant to him. So it's interesting that in spite of the fact that he was sitting in a Roman or was in the custody of the Romans and he was their prisoner politically speaking or with a nation or law or whatever you might say, that he viewed himself, he didn't, he didn't allow that to define him. He was saying, I'm a prisoner of Christ. That's who I belong to. That's who I serve. He's given me this dispensation. He's given me this job, this responsibility. And he looked at it as a grace from God, a gift of grace from God. Um, he was privileged to be able to be an apostle. How many apostles were there? Say that again. Thirteen, if you include Paul, in the number. Yeah, the twelve main ones, and then Paul was twelve later. Okay, was there one before that though? So forth. Yeah. So Judas, I understand you're excluding Judas, but yeah, it, it would be fourteen that were handpicked, chosen by the Lord. One fell out before things really got going, if you will, but one of thirteen or fourteen people in the history of humanity that were chosen to be a specific representative and ambassador for the kingdom of Christ. And Paul was among them and he saw that as a gift, as a blessing, as a privilege. Um, any other thoughts there? Just a minor note is that this book's one, unlike Romans or Galatians, this book was primarily written Gentile converse as opposed to converted to Judaism. Yeah, the book of Hebrews specifically written to Jews. Uh, there's some other indications uh, like Matthew or, and some others maybe had a Jewish audience mainly in mind. This one, along with a lot of what Paul wrote, was directed toward Gentile Christians, but he deals with those conflicts between the Jews and the Gentiles in some of those letters because there were issues there and pressure being put on the Gentiles very often to adhere to the law of Moses by those Jewish converts that were among them. But be that as it may, as he uh, addresses them here, uh, he tells them, look, I've been given this dispensation, and what's the purpose of that dispensation? Verses 3, 4, and following there. Other than Mike be able to write down exactly what he understood so that when the reader read those things, they could understand what was bestowed upon him as not. Right. What, what is he writing about? How does he describe this body of knowledge that he's conveying? Mystery. mystery. Why, why is it written as a mystery? How, maybe before we answer that, how do people in the religious world around us define that? How do they see mystery? They want to turn it into something that only the highly educated ordained people can understand and tell them what's going on. Right. It, it's not something that everybody can read and understand. It's still a mystery right. Right. for them, right. Right? right? Yeah, there's only certain individuals who are pri uh, privileged today to have a proper understanding and they need to be there to interpret that for us. But as Mike was saying there in our question number two, how do we understand the mystery and to what extent? It was his insight of the mysteries that he would give them. It says he's, he's been given how that by revelation. What is revelation? Holy Spirit. Okay, what's the process? Jesus laid it out in John chapter 16. What's the process of revelation? Jesus. Right. It, Jesus very specifically lays out, look, I'm, I'm not teaching what's my own. I, I'm teaching what the Father has. So the Father to the Son. The Son said, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit to guide you into all truth. 
And then that comes through the apostles, through Paul, through Peter, through others. He says, I've got this revelation and I'm writing this down so that you can read it. And we understand it, therefore, through reading or through hearing what has been revealed. And to what extent does he say? By which when you read verse 4, what's that? You may understand. You may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. I think there's a common misconception that somehow uh, Peter, Matthew, others in the first century had a super knowledge or a super advantage in understanding the Word of God over us. And that's not true. Just because they received direct revelation doesn't mean their understanding was inspired. Think about what Peter wrote about the prophets of the Old Testament. What did he say about them re related to the unfolding of the plan of salvation? Right. They looked into them but still couldn't understand them. Yeah. You think about Isaiah or Ezekiel, Jeremiah, how they were revealing things. They did not know what those meant, but they were revealing them. And Paul, Peter, others revealed things that they didn't necessarily instantly understand. They had to sit there and think about it, meditate on it. For me, one of the best examples of this is Peter on the day of Pentecost said, the promise is to you, to your children, and to all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call. So you go from Acts 2 where he stated that to Acts 10 and what problem do you have? You didn't want to go to the Gentiles. Those that were far off. Why, why would I go to a Gentile's house? What? Okay, I'm here. I'm here. I don't understand why I'm here. God just told me to come here and tell me why I'm here. And when Cornelius revealed that, then he understood. So he had to think about it. He had to be reasoned with to come to that understanding all who work righteousness. That's, that's who I'm supposed to take the gospel to. So he had revealed it before, but he didn't understand it until much later. And just this point of when Paul says, look, I write these things down so that when you read, you may understand my knowledge. You can understand like I understand. And we can. Now, are there some things hard to understand? Yeah. Yeah. Just book of Romans, right? Yeah, Peter specifically states that about the writings of Paul, how people struggle with it to their own destruction because they're unlearned. So he wrote very deep things, as we know, in the Roman letter and the Hebrew letter, and it was attributed to writing that. But yes, you, you are absolutely correct. Right, right, exactly. He specifically wrote that about Paul. There are hard, some things that are hard to understand. Not impossible, but it takes us a bit to wrestle with some of these things and to especially get to deeper meanings. And as we get older, as we continue to read the Bible, our depth of knowledge increases and we have a better understanding as time goes by. So he says you read it, you can understand it, you can know what this mystery is, something that was concealed but now has been revealed. He specifically says it's been revealed through him. And what was that mystery that he specifically has reference to? I mean, it would be broader than this, but he gives a specific point about it that he's addressing with them. That the Gentiles should be joint heirs. Right. The gospel has gone to all people. Right. This, this was a huge... I think we maybe... I don't know, maybe we underplayed a little bit, but this was a major issue, a huge hurdle for the Jews especially, but also became a hurdle for the Gentiles as the Jews influenced them and tried to pressure them that, you know, we need to follow the law, you follow the law, God revealed the law through Moses, Moses is the great prophet, 
all these things that it was a, a difficulty for them to understand they would all be together in one body, both Jew and Gentile. And we know that was not fully revealed before the gospel. All right, any other thoughts down through verse 7? All right, let's read verses 8 through 13, please. Who will grab that? Ephesians 3, 8 through 13. Elijah. Like to me, who am blessed to the least of all the saints, this grace was given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God, who created all things through Jesus Christ, to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers of the heavenly places, according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in Him. Therefore I ask that you do not lose part of my tribulations for you, which is your glory. Okay. So verse 8, he talks about these riches of Christ that are found in the mystery. He says that I should preach among the Gentiles those unsearchable riches. Um, he said before, when I write, you can read and understand. Now he's saying, I preach these things. What's, what's maybe the difference there and what's maybe the similarity there? Writing versus preaching. How, how would we classify those? Potentially. Writing is a permanent record. Preaching is something you remember. Okay, so, so there's some differences there. Writing is obviously the written word. Preaching being the spoken word. But they're both what? Words. 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 We, we cannot underestimate the power and the value of words. One of the first things you see happen in a time of um, attack and undermining of the truth is words are attacked. <clears throat> Meanings, definitions are changed or twisted. They're shaded. One of the great examples in our society is gay. Right? Gay. You say gay today, there's almost one exclusive understanding of that. It's sin, it's homosexuality. But what's the real, true meaning of gay? Happy. Why did they choose that word? They, they want to define their way of living as a happy way of living. That's why they chose that word. Right? So that clouds it now. That clouds our understanding of what that is and what it's about. Okay? So words are very important and words are used to convey truth. That's the way God chose to reveal His message to mankind is through words. Not through pictures, not through feelings or anything like that. He chose words to convey principles, concepts, thoughts, to give meaning to things. So you have the spoken word, you have the written word. Um, he didn't choose dramas, plays, things like that. But that's the way a lot of people want to turn today. He didn't choose music, as in musical instruments. You know, notes played on the instrument to convey things to us. He, he chose words to convey these things. And so we need to respect that and honor the words and the meaning of those words. So he says, he teaches or he preaches the unsearchable riches of Christ. What would some of those unsearchable riches be? Mike? Just a side note, what we yeah. were talking about before. He also doesn't teach us through feelings in our own understanding. You know, you use words for a very specific purpose, as you pointed out, um, and you know, it certainly isn't just zap, and then you all of a sudden have this feeling 
that overcomes you or anything like that. That's not how he's going to do them. Right. Ron? I just want to thought, Stephen, as we see very common today, is personal testimonies. You know, better mm -hmm. felt than told. Mm -hmm. And all of those things are, again, perversion of the course that God would have before us to go to the Word. Right. What, what a lot of people today use in the religious world is basically how they feel they interpret as, well, God's telling me to do this or God's telling me to do that. And you have a thousand people, you have a thousand different things that God's telling all these people. You understand, well, that can't be. That's, that's just chaos. That's confusion there. So, yeah, exactly right. All right, so these riches that are in Christ, what are they? Steve, I don't, I don't think we can list it because the word unsearchable means that I think what he means here is this is something that man could not come up with, but he's referring to the gospel here, and it'd take you know four weeks of study to, to to list everything because we couldn't come up with it. We can quantify it. It is unsearchable. We okay. can't come up with it, but it's the gospel. He's calling it that instead of the gospel. Okay, that it is the gospel. What what within that gospel is a blessing to us? Just one or two things. Well, I kind of did a cross-reference on the Word. And one of the things that Paul wrote about in Romans 2, 4 was that, or do you think lightly of the riches of His kindness, His tolerance, His patience, not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance? So, you know, those are certainly things that we can see that, are, you know, we have a blessing in is God's patience, His kindness towards us. Yes, Rob. Right. In Ephesians 1 7, we noted that, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, revealing to us the, the, some of the riches, of course. Right. We, we've got the gospel that reveals to us the plan of salvation that brings us into a relationship with God where we have forgiveness, where we can see and understand better his patience and things like that. But exactly what John was talking about, he qualifies these riches with unsearchable riches. These riches are beyond exhausting and we cannot fully fathom them. They are so abundant, so far reaching. That's why he describes them as these unsearchable riches. So question number three I ask as you continue on down through here, how is the manifold wisdom of God made known? And I asked you to explain that. What does he say? Verses 9, 10, 11. What does manifold mean, by the way? Many-sided. Yeah, many-sided. So manifold wisdom of God made known how? Church. By the church. Okay. What's the Roman Catholic view of this? They have special insight into it, I guess. The, what do they call it? Where the Pope sits on the seat. Right. He, he sits on his papal throne. And I think it's called Ex Cathedra. He, he speaks from the throne. And that's supposed to be divine revelation or divine knowledge coming forth. Roman Catholicism teaches that the church reveals and defines truth. And that's why when the Pope says, eat fish on Friday... And then decades later says, "Don't eat." It doesn't, or don't eat fish on Friday. And then decades later comes back and says, "It's okay to eat something other than fish on Friday," or homosexuality was wrong, and now he's come out and says it's not wrong. That's why they can do that. That's why they can go into any society and absorb the paganism in that society because they believe the church defines and reveals truth. Is that what this is saying? What, what's the reality of it? The truth reveals and defines the church. 
Nancy. Well, but it is the church that is sent to teach to reveal the plan. And that's, that's what he's saying here. It's made known by the church. It wasn't written by the church, but it's, it's the church that reveals the plan to others. The church members, does do that. Meaning individual members in the church. Pillar and ground of truth, 1 Timothy right. chapter 3, right? But what does he say here about the church made known by the church to what? Principalities and powers in the heavenly places. What would be included in that? Do what? Okay, rulers, angels. Right? Angels desired to know these things, to look into them, but they didn't know them. Peter talks about that. Here, here's what he what he's really driving at is that when you look at the church, and he's talking here, Jew and Gentile coming together, this great, grand, glorious body of Christ. When you look at that, you see the wisdom of God. Just like you look at the universal creation and you see God's creative power. Right? You look at the church, you see His redemptive power. And it's, it's like looking at a jewel. Right? If you look at a jewel in the light and you look at it from different angles, you get different pictures of that. And the beauty of that is revealed. And he's saying you look at the church and what God has done in it and all that that encompasses, you see this great wisdom of God. And it testifies to that. These principalities and powers in the heavenly places... They didn't get it. They didn't understand it. It wasn't revealed to them until the church came into existence and then they see, ah, the wisdom of God. The wonder of God. And that church carries that gospel out into the world that others may be partakers of that and be received into that. Any other thoughts or questions there? It goes on to say, according to the eternal purpose which He accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. So you, you have that whole reasoning behind what he's saying beforehand is there. That is the eternal purpose which was planned before time. Yes, question number four. You've taken us right there. What was the eternal purpose of God and how does this impact prevailing dom denominational doctrine? What's included in his eternal purpose, Ron and Clint? Well, as we're saying here, his eternal purpose and plan was to bring all things together within Christ, and Christ established one church, one kingdom. So the conflict is that the world today recognizes many heads and many bodies, but there is one head and one body, which was God's purpose, that he would be glorified through the Son. Yeah, they have a complete misunderstanding about the church, the nature of the church. Clint? Well, similar to what Ron has said, you know, if the word church and body no, is used no. simultaneously within this book, it's you know at the end of chapter 1, it's in chapter 2, no. now it's here in chapter 3. It's, the, it's a pattern of, of these words now coming together. But also there's that the doctrine that the Jews no, no. rejected Christ. And so then, you know, God failed in some way. And so then that would negate the kingdom coming. And so now plan B, oh, well, let's do a church. Right. That's not what it says. It's the eternal purpose was the, that Christ would be the head over the church. It would be existing today. Yes. That premillennial doctrine generally taught is Christ came to establish His kingdom. That was God's plan. But when the Jews ended up rejecting Him, God changed the plan, put the church in place temporarily till some point in the future Christ could come back and establish a kingdom. So their doctrine is the church is not the eternal purpose of God. But here it very specifically says it is according to His eternal purpose. It was concealed before Men didn't understand it, but in the first century, when it was established, that was revealed. This is what God planned all along. 
Right. Yeah, had, had the Jews not rejected him, he never would have put on the cross. You know, they would have accepted him and he never would have died for the sins of the world. So how we can say this is not an eternal purpose, whenever you say that, what you're saying is you discount the sacrifice that he did to lay down. What? How would men have been forgiven? <laughs> that's that's the thing that always puzzles me, Nancy. Well, that's that's kind of the aspect of what this says to me: the eternal purpose, the blood redemption was eternal. So, if you were a patriarch and you did what God said, if you were a Jew living under the law of Moses and you did what God said, then when Jesus came, it was eternal from the beginning. That blood covered everything. Mm -hmm. Absolutely every dispensation was covered with the blood of Christ. Yes. And in this one that he's, he's writing about with them dealing with that issue, Jew and Gentile, he says the blood covers both Jew and Gentile. It goes back to the very beginning of time for Adam and Eve, comes forward to us and will be to the end of time. And he's saying it's for both the Jew and the Gentile, which they were having a hard time understanding and accepting. That God had planned this all along to have both come together in one body. And when he talks about the church being the eternal purpose, whenever anybody teaches that premillennial doctrine where the church was kind of a last minute afterthought of God, an alternate plan B, as Clint said, that's blaspheming. That's blaspheming God, blaspheming the church, the bride of Christ. Because it's God's eternal purpose. Because what it does is it knocks the church down as it's really not that important. What's really important is the kingdom that's going to come. And that's part of why we see in the religious world around us that people denigrate the church. They don't think it's a big deal. You can be a part of any church you want to because it's, it's, it's just another one of those layers of diminishing the importance and the value of the church, the body for which Christ died. Any other thoughts? Yeah, um, I was taking on first ten to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heaven places might be known. If Satan would have known that by killing Jesus, uh, he would have known he would never crucify the, the uh, Lord of Glory because he didn't know that he was going to be resurrected. He thought that he had to be his power, but he didn't know. If that would have been known to Satan, he would never crucify the Lord, Lord of Glory. Right, Satan. Satan just played into it. He thought, I'm getting rid of him. And it actually was what broke Satan's power was his sacrifice on the cross. So he says all of this, that this great eternal purpose, this mystery that's now been revealed and all of that. And verse 12, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through him. Because God's eternal purpose is accomplished in Christ, we have access to the Father and we have this great boldness we have a confidence and assurance. We, we have this faith that allows us to go forward in life in serving God and having that assurance and the hope of the resurrection from the dead to eternal life. Now question five, I ask over what should we not lose heart and what does this mean? And that's really focused more on verse 13 there. What does Paul say? Do not lose heart over what? His tribulations. His tribulations. How, how could they lose heart over his tribulations? Seeing what he's going through, they would lose their faith. I guess is one way to think of it. They would feel less... Okay, let me ask you this. Okay. Have you ever seen anyone trying to do something and they... It looks like they failed, they're not doing any good, they're not accomplishing it, and so you think to yourself, I'm not going to try that. Mike? Yeah, I was going to say that, you know, this can happen to him, it can certainly happen to me. And if he can be in prison, so can I. And, you know, that's kind of scary to us as far as I am Seeing as you mentioned in the introduction to this chapter of Paul being in prison, you know, if it was according to man, they would think the Roman government has control over Paul. But through God, as we understand in Paul's life, it took him to the highest levels of principalities and powers of government 
that the word of God was preached. So it's completely contrary to the again the wisdom of man and the wisdom of this world. And yes. The of Satan. Yes. Thanks. Uh, another aspect of of what causes people to to lose heart or lose faith is thinking, why would God let this happen to him? Mm -hmm. It's not that they feel it's going to happen to me. It's why is God letting this happen to him? And that is a stumbling block for some people. Well, God's not really involved like he said he would be. Right, exactly right. So let's tie some of this together. As he makes this statement, he says, do not lose heart over my tribulation for you. He says, I've gone through hardships. I've made sacrifices for you. You ever feel like if, if somebody making a sacrifice for you, you say, oh, you, you ha don't have to do that. You shouldn't do it. I feel bad that this has happened because you were trying to help me. And he's saying, don't feel bad about that. Why is he saying don't feel bad about that? Just like Peter says in 1 Peter, you know, uh, did anyone suffer as a Christian? Let him not be ashamed, but let him be a glory for God. Yeah, to glorify God. And here, he's telling it's for your glory. It's for your benefit. What does he already at the beginning of the chapter describe himself as having been prisoner of Christ? This grace that has been given to me. It, what he's... What he's go ahead. I'm sorry. No. It, for, for, he says, for you Gentiles. Whenever he starts out the chapter, it's not just a statement of being the prisoner of Christ, but it has a reason behind it for you Gentiles in this particular time. Yeah. He said, this is why I'm here. Right. I'm here for this. Right. And so, so don't be discouraged over what's happening to me. Don't lose heart over that. I'm here for this. As a parent, have you ever made sacrifices for your children? Your, your children are, you know, maybe they feel kind of bad about that. Well, I, I'll spend and be spent for you. That's why I'm here, to help you out. And he's saying that to the Ephesians and about the Gentiles in general here. Um, we need to be thankful for the sacrifice that others make. Don't let that discourage us when we see them experiencing hardship, tribulations, persecutions, be thankful that they're willing to do that and encourage them in that and let that inspire you to great service to God. Any other thoughts there? There's, I got one more. Nancy, I'm coming back to what you said, so remind me. This quick. That goes, comes back to the love of God, the love of our fellow men. Because if you love, you're doing it for them. You're loving God, you're doing it for them and for Him. So yes. It's, it's a, it all comes down to this same point of doing it for them. Yes. And because you love them, not because you're getting some special benefit out of it, you're doing it for them. Right. But it enriches you. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Um, the, the things that Paul went through took him to stand before Nero twice. Besides other lesser rulers. He went and stood before the most powerful man on the planet and preached the gospel to him. He ne that never would have happened. If he had written a letter to Nero and said, hey, I want to come talk to you about Jesus of Nazareth. <laughs> I never would have let him in there. But because he was arrested and put into the system and he said, I appeal to Caesar, boom. He has an audience with Caesar, with everybody else who's around Caesar. He's able to teach the gospel there. The Lord had revealed that to him on the road to Damascus. I'm going to send you. You're going to go to the Gentiles. You're going to preach before kings and rulers. And he did that. That was his whole purpose of existing, of living on this planet. Serve God, we understand his personal relationship, but in serving God, 
his role, his duty, his path was he would be persecuted, but he would preach the gospel far and wide as a result of that. Mike. And you look at how unique he was in the apostles that he was the only one that could have had that appeal to Caesar because of his citizenship. And, you know, all of these things had to line up. So obviously we see God kind of moving the pieces on the board as he uh, goes through time. Right. That, that's a whole other level of amazement and beauty of how God in His providence brought all of this about. Uh, we need to do a study sometime of Acts 27. To me, that is one of the most amazing accounts of the providence of God and what unfolds in there. But be that as it may, let's read uh, 3 verses 14 to 21. Who will get that for us? Ephesians 3, 14 to 21. Great. For this reason, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that He would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend all with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God now to him who is able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. All right. So Paul has this prayer for the Ephesians. How would you generally describe what it is that he's wanting for them? He's asking that they be strengthened in the inner man by the Spirit and that Christ will dwell in their hearts by faith and that they would know the love of Christ and be filled with the fullness of God. Yeah. That they would be spiritually enriched and nourished and strengthened in the Lord. So, question number six, I ask, what is strengthened through His Spirit? He makes specific mention of it there. Verse 16. The inner man. What's he talking about? What's the inner man? The mind heart. The, the, the mind, mind heart? heart? The soul. <laughs> the soul. We talked about this before. The soul is who you are. Your body is just a shell, just a container, just a tent. The soul is who you are. He's saying, I, I want you to be strengthened in your soul. And so question number seven, how does Christ dwell in us and is it different from the Father or the Holy Spirit? And I ask you to explain with Scripture. So how does Christ dwell in us? Through His Word. Okay, through faith. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. So Christ dwells in us through the Word. Is it different for the Holy Spirit or for the Father? No different. What scripture do we have? Well, Jesus and Him and the Father were one. Okay, they're, they're all unified as the Godhead, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. So it makes sense how one dwells in us, the other dwells in us. Seals our inheritance. You know, seals our, our faith seals the inheritance that. Uh, yeah, He's the guarantee of our inheritance. The Holy Spirit absolutely is. Um, if you want to write these down, uh, John 15, 4-7, Christ dwells in us and we dwell in Him. John 15, 4-7, Christ dwells in us, we dwell in Him. In 1 John 4, verses 12-16, the Father dwells in us and we dwell in Him. What does it mean when we dwell in the Father? Keep His commandments. We keep His commandments. We're walking in His way. And He's dwelling in us because His commandments are what are shaping our thoughts, our ideas, our feelings, our desires, our outlook, our behavior. So He dwells in us. We dwell in Him. Aren't we incorporating within ourselves the divine nature that Peter teaches us about? 
Yes, that's exactly what Peter's talking about in 2 Peter chapter 1, that the divine, we take on the divine nature, not that we have divinity, but we take these characteristics of holiness, righteousness, truth, justice, <coughs> compassion, love, mercy. We take those things on ourselves. So Romans 8, verses 1 and really through 11, but 9 through 11, talks about the Holy Spirit dwelling in us and us dwelling in the Holy Spirit. A lot of our religious friends and neighbors get this idea when the, whenever the Bible talks about the Holy Spirit dwelling in us that it's a literal, physical, bodily indwelling of the Holy Spirit in us. And that's different than the way Christ dwells in us. But the Bible teaches that all three members of the Godhead, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, dwell in us. Let me ask you, what is a theological problem with the Holy Spirit bodily indwelling in us. There is a major, major issue. We can still commit sin in our bodies and the Holy Spirit is in our body in that. Okay, we can commit sin in our bodies and that causes Him to participate in it. Anything else? Let me ask you this. What was unique about Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Mary and supposed son of Joseph? God in the flesh. God in the flesh. Why was He God in the flesh? So He could die for our sins. Yes, yes. But how, how did He become God in the flesh? What's that? Through a it was a miracle. Through the Holy Spirit. It's because a divine being took on flesh, dwelt in flesh. There's a uniqueness. We call it the incarnation. If the Holy Spirit bodily dwells in us, you have a lot of incarnations and there's really nothing unique about Jesus. It takes that away. So the Spirit dwells in us. We dwell in the Spirit. Father dwells in us. Son dwells in us. We dwell in them. I would submit to you the Holy Spirit never bodily inhabited anyone ever. You know, some people think, well, the apostles had that. No. The apostles had divine revelation. They were baptized in the Spirit. And it talks about the Spirit dwelling them, us. It's through the Word, through that revelation, that the Spirit was with them and in them. So... We want to make sure we get that down because there's a lot of people who have some pretty far out ideas about the Holy Spirit. And I just want to make this point. Same thing it says about the Spirit, it says about the Son. And what works for one, how one operates, the other operates as well. Nancy. Well, Christ told them that the, the Comforter of the Spirit would come and bring all things to their remembrance. Once again, we're tied back to the Word. Mm -hmm. Because they already knew these things through his teaching and his influence with them, and then the Spirit helped them remember them and later write them. Right, right, exactly. All right, with the moment we have left, question number eight what can God do? He can do all that we ask him. Um, yeah, let's let's drill on that just a minute. What it, what does it say there? Exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. Mm -hmm. Exceedingly abundantly. Paul's piling on those adjectives again. Exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. Let me ask you: Can you ask and think pretty big things? I can. I can. But what can God do? More than we can imagine. You remember one occasion, okay? I don't want to get too far off on a tangent, so y'all stick with me and then we're going to close it. All right. Remember when Hezekiah received a letter from the Assyrian commander and basically the Assyrian commander is like, all right, you just need to give up because we're going to come in and completely decimate you guys. And Isaiah or Hezekiah took that before God. The message came back. Don't worry about it. Not a problem. In one night, 185,000 Assyrian soldiers killed. They took off. They left. That's exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. All right. 
I don't want to get anybody's hopes up, but we have no idea what God has in store for this nation. We don't. I have a particular view of where we're headed. But I'm a man. I don't know. Maybe there is. Maybe there's something bigger. Maybe it's like a Paul situation. Yeah, persecution's coming, but look at what the result's going to be. It may be that. We pray about people obeying the gospel. And in a society where everything is easy, people are rich, they have all that they need, they'll shut their hearts off. But if things become difficult, hearts open up. They're searching for answers. And maybe that's what we're going to see. And there's a great time of harvesting of souls. I don't know, but he says the Lord can do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. He can do that with nations. He can do that with individuals. We put our faith, our confidence in Him. Alright, we need to close out there. Thank you all very much. Lord willing, Ephesians 4 next week.